Welcome back to Left Anchor. This is Alexi the Greek. And I'm Ryan Cooper. Um, today, I think we're going to start off with uh, just a little bit of news. Uh, over the last two days, there have been a couple of uh, basically fascist paramilitary groups who have, who have done... Um, violent uh, demonstrations and uh, attack people in New York City and also Portland, Oregon. Um, in New York City, the, uh, the, the, the Proud Boys, um, they had an event at the, uh, let's see, there was a re- re- Republican event at the headquarters of the... Um, the New York City, no, the New York Republican governor, his campaign headquarters is at this Republican uh, uh, property in New York City. And so they hosted a Proud Boys event in which Gavin McInnes, who is a co-founder of Vice Media, he's left Vice Media 10 years ago, um, and he um, was... They're doing this event, which supposedly, uh, according you know, according to a social media post, this guy they 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 were they were celebrating the 58th anniversary of the assassination of the uh, Japanese socialist um, Inajiro Asanuma. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, pronunciation, but but. F- Fifty-eight years ago, this guy who was the head of the J- Japanese Socialist Party was, you know, um, in some sort of public forum. This like seventeen-year-old ultra-nationalist Japanese like fruitcake just stabbed him with a samurai sword, and somebody won the Pulitzer Prize for um, this uh, a picture of the, you know, he just happened to be standing right there, and he took a picture of the guy you know, just getting, like, you know, skewered by this fucking nutcase. And so, you know, Gavin McInnes, uh, in this event, you know, they called it, a, he, he said it was an inspiring moment, this, uh, this murder of a politician. Um, and then afterwards, these guys are all riled up, and they went around looking for a fight, and they found one. And apparently there was just like some brawls uh, afterwards, and uh, some some local photojournalists caught, you know, and some guys on tape. Someone was like people who could pretty be clearly identified, just doing like a like a thirty on three beat down of these guys. Um, NYPD, of course, did not do anything to the Proud Boy fascist gang uh, uh, members, but they did arrest three Antifa people for, like, starting a fight, allegedly. And those guys were arraigned over the weekend. But, you know, it's just, like, pretty pretty classic fascist... um, Violent fascist gangs usually have the sort of tacit even a subconscious support of the police, if not the actual explicit support or actual police membership in the fascist gangs. That's been a characteristic of extreme right, right-wing politics going back uh, hundreds of years. Um, and then the next day, this basically the same thing happened again in, in Portland. There was a march for so-called law and order for, you know, which is, I mean, basically, you know, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the white version of, like, MS-13. You know, uh, people who would sort of, you know, if they were living in a different context, would be, like, ISIS members. Violent murderers, um, but just who happen to have the ear of the authorities. And so these guys were brawling with Antifa, you know, spraying each other with pepper spray, you know, beating each other up. And... um you know some pretty pretty serious um, injuries apparently on most most parts. And again, 
you know, no sign that the Portland police, who are notoriously sympathetic towards the, um, you know, f- fascist gangs in the area, are, you know, looking to really crack down on these these guys either. And so this is kind of like, I mean, the grand scheme of things, just like a handful of people fighting, like this is not any kind of, you know, really serious type of paramilitary organization. And I think it's fairly telling that the one in New York City, you know, the one fight that they, they, they were celebrating as a lone guy, this Japanese uh, guy who, who sort of rushed up and stabbed this person, you know, in a very, very intimate and very uh, just the the level of the level of frenzy and and motivation that it takes to do something like that to someone you know you're not getting whipped up with your friends you're not you know getting uh uh the sort of like group mob mentality going at all it's like someone who is like absolutely dedicated to this 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 cause um and they're celebrating that kind of mentality. And what what do they do? They go out and they like sort of jump someone in a ten to one dis- disadvantage, you know. Uh, not the kind of kamikaze uh, mindset that you would that you would uh, that they're trying to emulate there. It's more of a kind of like I like picking on people as long as it's no absolutely no danger to myself whatsoever, you know. Bully a bully mentality and not an actual f- not an actual frenzied. Mm- um, murderer mentality. Yeah, exactly. There's more cowardice uh, than courage and, and more um, kind of privilege operating in a illusory form of uh, demonstrating power than anything else. Um, but there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of psychology to unpack, but, uh, um, but even though there's not a lot of um, numbers to the groups of people involved here, I, th- I think, uh, it's worth unpacking just for the ways in which it might be uh, indicative of these broader patterns of ideological, psychological, and um, and political thinking and action. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that is not to say that I think this is, like, harmless. You know, I think it's, like, sort of at an incipient stage. Um, people are not at—they have not been brutalized or self-brutalized at a level where they could, you know, actually carry out the things which they think are— kind of cool it's it's more at a play acting stage it seems to me at least at this point and even if that's not to where you would have the sort of discipline and and zealotry necessary to like stab somebody in on national television at the same time you know they were really beaten on these these folks who are apparently like pretty badly injured you know so um yeah and it and as as Machiavelli might say, um, you know, in the in a metaphor that's that's medical and about diagnosing uh, political disease or political problems um, in the body politic, the earlier you try to diagnose, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to get the diagnosis uh, correct, but uh, the easier to treat. The farther along the disease develops the easier it is to understand what the what the disease is and, and what the diagnosis should what it should be. But it, it might be too late to treat at that point. It's much harder to treat. So uh, to the extent that like these these represent these incipient, as you say, uh, developments in the body politic, it might be worth kind of teasing out, even if, if it's just uh, uh, small flashpoints, what the implications are um, and, and what could develop if we aren't uh, vigilant, right? Yeah, and this might be a good, you know, a good opportunity to kind of bring out a little bit of the uh <clears throat> some of the traditional analysis of um you know, fascism and economic development or economic crisis. Um and maybe a good place to start would be with uh with with Hannah Arendt. Um, which I, you know, she has her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and she talks a lot about fascism in there. I haven't read that book in a long time, but I think 
maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think it's fair to say that, that her overwhelming focus is on the uh, internal psychology and internal politics of uh, fascism in, you know, how it develops and what the sort of internal mindset of people who join fascist uh, movements is and what happens to the kind of like ordinary uh, people who, you know, end up living in a fascist totalitarian society and almost not at all on the political economy of fascist states and especially not on the maybe a little bit, but not very much on on the political economy, which enables fascists to, to take power. Um. I don't know. Do, do you, would you say that's a fair? That's fair. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. That's fair. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I don't, you know, I, I'm not really qualified to judge her sort of psychological stuff, but I think that that is a, 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 a pretty serious and, in fact, like almost disqualifying omission if you're talking about, you know, what, what, what you actually care about with fascism, which is like, how do you stop this, <laughs> you know, as opposed to like, like, what is a really nuanced understanding of it? Yeah, maybe that's an important thing to do. But like, at the end of the day, the important thing is to stomp this out as soon as possible. Yeah, I think it's certainly helpful to understand the, right, the material conditions that give rise structurally, um, politically and economically, and the way that fascism develops uh, through those structures and the ideologies ties um, to the ways in which um, the political economy um, operates in fascism, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, another definition, a, fam- a famous definition from uh, Robert Paxton, who is a, uh, he's a, a political scientist, historian guy, and and he had a famous book in from 2004, The Anatomy of Fascism, and um, he said that fascism, uh, quote, fascism may be defined as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood, and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites abandons democratic liberties and pursues with a redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraints goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. So this is like a handy summary of of like the sort of like politics of fascist parties. But, but, um, Again, we're kind of missing the the uh, the uh, what am I trying to say here the 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 political economy aspect of it, except for the except for the community decline, which I think is a very important part of it. Right, right. Because what what you're pointing out is the uh, the real causal factors have something to do with uh, the ways in which. Uh, the political economy had perhaps failed the people and or the ways in which the political economy was used by um, those political actors that um, kind of uh, espoused and developed this ideology, right, um, in order to gain power or, or sustain power. Right. So, so I, in other words, there's a danger in a lot of this analysis. And by the way, Arendt is fantastic in many ways and very valuable for understanding uh, totalitarianism, uh, understanding um, fascism. But, but I guess what uh, we as, as left anchor hope to do in this episode is try to focus on a, an oft neglected aspect, which is right. Like what does fascism uh, and perhaps specifically right national socialism, but just fascism writ large, um, what's its relationship to nationalism, but more important, more importantly, what's its relationship to the political economy, to capital, to the ways in which um, uh, workers and capitalists um, kind of are are treated, and and how does that help us understand both its cause and and how it operates? Yeah, and and so you know, one a bit of sort of classic history here. Um, when uh, when Hitler started coming up in politics in the early 1920s, 
um, he reached his sort of like first high water mark in I think it was what 1992 with the beer or, or sorry 1922 with the beer hall putsch, a uh, failed coup attempt basically, which he did with a uh, uh, general Ludendorff, um, and this was at the at the sort of peak of a hyperinflation at the time would basically, you know, in which like the German currency was being destroyed. And that was a kind of uh, that that basically, you know, in a nutshell, gives you the the kind of uh, the soil of of fascist organizing, which is some kind of ec- severe economic troubles, which I think I see what I, you did there. That's a nice double entendre with soil. Well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and um but after, so it failed, he was put in jail, got a light sentence because uh, so many people sympathized him with the, sympathized with him in the in the uh, German elite. And um, but then you know the the inflation problem was fixed, and Germany returned to like reasonable you know full employment or if not full employment, reasonably close to it. Um, and Hitler was totally sidelined, and the Nazi Party got like you know, hardly any votes in the uh, 1928 uh, election. But then comes the Great Depression. And um, along with the Great Depression, uh, I mean, you know, when the cause of the Great Depression and what made it a Great Depression as opposed to a recession in Germany was the austerity policy of the center party um, technocrats who were you know, the chancellors, particularly Heinrich Brüning from, you know, I believe it was 1930 to 1932, you know, basically pursued your classic, like, massive tax increases and spending cuts, which, you know, jacked up unemployment to, you know, from like 10% to 30%. And at the exact same time, um, Nazi Party electoral fortunes, you know, they went from like a couple of percent, uh, uh, in the polls in 1928 up to 37 in 1932 election um you know them and the communists had got got a majority of the seats in the bundestag i believe which meant that there was no one like there was a majority of uh even if you combined every other party you didn't you couldn't have people who believed in democracy um and so the chancellor was more or less forced to use a constitutional stipulation that he could rule by decree. Um, and then eventually, you know, there was this, the, the, you know, talking before about Paxton's uh, collaboration with, with uh, traditional elites, you know, he was, Hitler was assigned, he was uh, appointed chancellor after sort of a long lobbying campaign and the traditional German conservatives, um, France, von Papen, if I remember correctly, really lobbied to have Hitler put in uh, as chancellor. And that was it. Once he was chancellor, it was like just a couple of years before it was a total totalitarian dictatorship. Hitler rolled up all the party, all the power under his own banner. In fact, he murdered uh, von Papen, if I remember correctly, in the Night of the Long Knives. Um, Can I just say that you're doing a great job with the pronunciation? I, for some reason, you're you're always the one that has to pronounce all the names. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm doing it right or not, so it's pure guesswork. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I know I speak a bit of Spanish, but not even not a lick of German. Prove it. Prove it. Um. Ach, mein Lieber. <laughs> the famous Spanish phrase. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah, that, I, you know, that, that I think this used to be very commonplace history. In fact, like, like no one would even have bothered to deny it. It's like saying that the Dixiecrats were racist, um, that, that Hitler came to, the Hitler used the great depression to come to power since the 2016 election there's been a real mobilization to try to find excuses that or try to find new methods of interpretation that did downplays the roles of the economic collapse in enabling hitler's rise to power because it seems to suggest that trump's rise may have been somehow enabled by the you know economic crisis uh in 2008 
and therefore, you know, sort of legitimize that in some way. And so there's been like this sort of cottage industry of takes to say that actually it's just that like people became very racist all of a sudden and they weren't ready for a woman president or whatever and the economy didn't have anything to do with it. And that I think is just like not convincing in the slightest. Ryan, the next thing you're going to tell me is that racism and slavery have something to do with capitalism. <laughs> don't don't try to sell me that that bridge. I don't know. Yeah. Uh Yeah, do you do you I mean, do you um you know, the the as I was saying, like the Great Depression became great because it was sort of made so, you know. And it was made it was choice. It was made so because like you had a big shock and then the economic liberals of the time in Europe especially and especially Germany but you know Herbert Hoover Heinrich Brüning um they uh attempted you know the sort of like equivalent of bleeding the patient you know to make them better and it took a shock and it made it into a you know cataclysmic depression to where you know you had 30% unemployment 25% unemployment in the United States um and you know it it was it was the it was an indication of an ideology which has gotten itself trapped in this sort of like self-perpetuating doom loop and in that way enabling you know the the most violent and extreme people uh, who would sort of prey on the insecurities of the people and the discrediting of traditional parties to say, like, look, look at these people. They don't know what they're doing. They're ruining everything. They say this, these sacrifices are necessary. These sacrifices are not necessary. These people are idiots. You need to just give all the power to me, and I'll fix everything quickly and easily. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, when it came to the German economy, at least in terms of unemployment, that's that was totally true when like the 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 um the great depression was fixed first and was fixed fastest in germany and the way they did it was by completely abandoning all the liberal bromides they just spent 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 on rearmament and put everyone back to work within like a year or two and you know most of the german society basically concluded well i guess hitler was right we uh this democracy is a garbage system and we just, you know, we just have to uh, trust the, the der Fuhrer and, um, you know, because at least everyone will have a job then. And, that, you know, and it was they I think many of them later came to regret that notion. But it was like it was the, the one two process of liberals ruining their societies and then dictators coming in to just like fix the big problems, at least. And it just. It, it massively enabled terrible, terrible politics. Right. Like where the left might agree uh, di- in the diagnosis with um, fascism, right, is is that um, there are better ways than unfettered capitalism and economic liberalism to um, use power with regard to resources and to affect um how the economy operates, right? So uh, as Polanyi's pointed out, how we've, has, how we've talked about before, uh, the quote-unquote self-regulating market is going to be a disaster. And what's going to happen is you're going to have this this outcry socially and politically for uh, some system that can actually uh, ensure that people don't suffer tremendously. <laughs> and and that can definitely be done um, through like dictatorship and through any any range of political uh, structures that that involve privatization or involve uh, nationalization, any combination of things. But when that economic uh, suffering is alleviated, as you say, right, what happens politically is is you get popular support for whatever form of power was able to um, right basically cure the problem caused by um, economic liberalism. So the fact that, and it wasn't like historically, right? It could have been the left in Germany, right? Yeah. And, and that, so, so that was, a, that was um, it was not inevitable that it was going to be the right, but it, it could have been um, 
it could have been a different history and a different outcome, but it was the, the, the right wing that uh, ended up kind of initially at least saving saving the, the political economy from, from disaster and, and alleviating suffering. And, and that allowed the way for power to grow even more so that other ideological components of that system uh, were left unchecked and were allowed to, uh, to turn into what, what we now recall as, as the most disastrous evil regime in history. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there's, um, there's, there's, like you're talking about kind of liberals, like the sort of maybe, you know, the broad center of society. Um, what you saw in Germany was that like liberalism was breaking down and um, there, there was kind of like, you know, like as, as mass unemployment, like got worse and worse and worse. Uh <clears throat> There was sort of like there was sort of like two big you know po- polarization sort of accelerated. You had like l- real fascist street brawls with like like dozens of casualties on a daily basis between the communists and the fascists, and the liberals in the pinch basically concluded that uh, that it was better to have Hitler that Hitler could be controlled. And that it was better to have Hitler and a sort of like right wing dictatorship than it than it would be to have a a communist uprising that would seize the private property of wealthy businessmen. And, you know, it, in the logic of that is fairly easy to understand, even though many of these guys were literally murdered by Hitler later. You know, it was a disastrous miscalculation in that sense. But, um, oops. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's like if, if you are stuck so far inside the liberal self-regulating market so that, that like you think, uh, that if, if, you know, the only way to solve mass employment is by clinging ever tighter to the gold standard and austerity and, um, you know, orthodox measures, um, that is sort of where you're going to end up being pushed. But the other way is to to go the sort of FDR way, and you just kind of appropriate whatever you know some bits and pieces of the kind of left wing agenda that you uh, you know are, are attractive to you or whatever or like seem most plausible, and you abandon um, the market. Uh, self-regulating market ideology, especially the gold standard, which is the thing that FDR got rid of the first and in an incredibly, you know, like, like blatant and, and almost cartoonish fashion. You know, he was literally adjusting the price of gold over his, over his morning soft boiled eggs. It was this like famous story where (laughs) I was like, what, uh, today it's going up by 21 cents. It's like what? What's twenty one cents? I'm like, well, that's three times seven. That's a very lucky number. <laughs> <laughs> and the point, you know, the point was just to push it up by a bit. And it wasn't had no logical. It it had no like like empirical, rational, like technical. Basis, yeah. yeah, it was just a sort of random guess. But it was like it just needs to go up a bit, and just like keep pushing it up a bit. And it was like, yeah, that that worked pretty well. That was all you needed to do was to just like stop making things worse all the time. And, um, you know, that also seemed to work quite well, you know, cause like if you can just get rid of the mass unemployment, even though, you know, the great depression wasn't fixed in the United States until world war two, so long as you didn't just keep, you know, sticking more knives into the body politic for no reason, you know, to, to push people into the very worst type of, you know, the, 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 the darkest facets of the human soul, um, that, that, that could work too, at least in the 1930s. So we seem to have, we're starting to make a parallel, um, between, you know, the history of the, of Germany, uh, after the great depression and the kind of rise of the Reich and Hitler, uh, and the ways in which both, 
the left and the right in Germany uh, were clashing and trying to battle for power in, in the wake of the failures of economic liberalism uh, and capitalism and, and how that might map on to what's going on with neoliberalism today and what paved the way for Trump and, and how somehow that uh, can be seen in this in this picture of the, the recent Proud Boys and um, kind of uh, paramilitary slash proto-fascist um, pro-Trump groups that are clashing with Antifa in Portland and New York. Well, so so let's try to make that link a little bit more um, distinct or clarify what what we're what we're saying is. Uh, is to be gleaned and what, what, what can be applied today from, from that history. Uh, what, what are we investigating here? What, the, there's the link between the political economy and how that relates to uh, what kind of politicians and movements politically are empowered. Um, there's the psychology uh, and the ways in which ideology and the psych- psychology of different ideologies um, animates citizens of the body politic uh, in the context of certain economic uh, realities. Um, wh- where should we go from here? What should we, what should we uh, look at first? Before you do that, can we take a break? I've Let's r- take a pee. I've run out of <laughs> beverage. <laughs> yeah. Get a, Get another beverage. Yep. Okay. Making some tea. Hey, hey. Yo. Hi, Emma. Uh, Alexi says that, yeah, soon. We've got a bit left. Like a half an hour, maybe? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, do you want to um, reference the like the Corey Robin Jacobin piece or the LA Review things by name, or are we or should we just do like a free flowing discussion? Uh, so, sure. I mean, if you, I mean, I feel like you, you. Pr- I, I read those, but uh, I, th- I feel like you uh, covered a lot of it. Yeah, well, you I'm, <clears throat> you seem to know him a little bit better. 
Uh, yeah, you, whatever, whatever uh, you want to do. I would say definitely, you know, feel free to bring them up. Okay. Um, I did, I, Should we? Uh, so, so we can start back up. I I just asked a, a big. Yeah, to, right. To to. Like a whole thing on how we should go forward from the historical parallel to the kind of Proud Boys slash Antifa clash today. And like the ways in which these these movements on the right and left are paralleling the same. Um, like yeah. what's behind? There's there's clearly a there's a clear parallel in this um, response from the left and right to the inadequate economic liberalism, right? And 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 all that. So so what are we to learn uh, about psychology, ideology, political economy, etc.? Yeah, I think that that uh, it, it. My general take on this is that the that the. 2008 through the present day has been a kind of uh, a a pale shadow of the history of the 1930s. Um, you know, so you had the, the, the crisis of 2008, um, which was probably worse than the crisis of two, uh, 1929 in terms of the global effects and the effects inside the United States, especially. Um you know, it it really hammered the economy in that those first couple of quarters, and you know, as it turned out, the the r- ruling, um, you know, the ruling party at the time did manage to kind of fix things, uh, in a way to kind of kind of sort of restore the status quo. Uh, but the way they did that was really terribly harmful to the um you know giant chunk of the you know middle and working class you know so pr- probably the response to homeowners was worst in the United States like basically that was like the the you know you had these massive loans which had been made against very overvalued assets in the bubble years and when the value of the assets collapsed, the the uh, you know the question is who's going to take the hit? Well, according to the you know liberal capitalists who are running the Obama administration, the banks couldn't take the hit because that would have meant totally restructuring the uh, financial system, and it would have meant the government absorbing lots of losses. The government probably was in the best position to absorb those losses because they can literally print money, but that would have been very politically unpalatable, especially amongst like the ruling class and the donor class. And so the way they did it was basically to stuff all the losses onto homeowners and uh, while pretending that's not what they were doing. So they had a, a, a program which was supposed to, you know, the Home Assistance Mortgage Program, HAMP, I believe it was called, and um, it, it you know, is supposed to assist homeowners who are underwater in their mortgage. What it was really doing was shifting the losses from the banks to the homeowners, and they're like 9 million people were forced out of their homes as a result of the, the f- utter failure of this program, which probably, in the worst part of the crisis, increased foreclosures rather than decreasing them. And um, this, you know, sort of like really accelerated the the economic damage from, you know, the previous decade of free trade policy, which had really cored out a lot of the industrial base in, in you know, uh, places in Appalachia, uh, around the Rust, Rust Belt, you know, like places that had just like lost all of their economic foundation. And the result in terms of, you know, the, like you see it all over every day, like the um, life expectancy is declining amongst white people without a college degree. Um, you, you see uh, this op- opioid yes, crisis, opioid overdoses, absolute epidemic in the, this demographic and um you know it, it you, you can you can't draw one to one correspondence between those happenstance and the rise of people like Trump because like the average Trump voter is not a poor working class person however 
I think that was a very important catalyst in terms of enabling this kind of politics, um, you know, because you you had a, a considerable portion of what had been the Democrats' traditional working class base, and this has happened in a lot of countries, like like working class parties that have been neoliberalized and and went in on financialization and all that kind of crap. Uh, their formerly leftist base have have uh, you know they've been kicked out of the union, they've lost their jobs or their companies, and they've turned right. They've gone in on you know nationalism and sort of like conservative identity politics. Yeah, and and also just to keep in mind, like Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million, but the reason she lost in the electoral map in the electoral college is because of the Ruster steel belt, right? So like specifically the thousands of votes that mattered had to do with exactly the type of people you're talking about and exactly the type of people who were left behind by neoliberalism and, and the Democrats essentially. Yeah. The, and the, you know, the, the, the way they ran their campaign, too, you know, the way Obama ran in 2012 when he was running against this plutocrat, like, neoliberal bloodsucker was very working class in a way that, frankly, made a lot of the Democrats at the time very uneasy. You remember That's Cory right. Booker being all, uh, you know, getting his knickers in a twist over criticizing Bain Capital because Bain Capital has a shitload of money in New Jersey and they probably bribed him up to his back teeth. Um, and he, you know, That's despite right. the fact that this guy was the Republican nominee for president, Cory Booker was like, well, let's not be uncivil here. Um, <laughs> I wish Antifa would beat up Cory Booker. Sorry. I didn't mean, <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I didn't mean that. Sorry. That's, uh, I meant that's it. A, I didn't it. mean it. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, and Deval Patrick, right? Uh, all these neoliberals who are scared shitless, even when someone in in the pocket of Wall Street like Obama gives at least a head fake towards being populist in some way, right? Scares the shit out of them. Um, but no, he ran a very clever campaign in that sense because Romney was not just, you know, strapping his dog to the roof and, and talking about the right height of the trees in Michigan. He also was totally clueless about his, uh, you know, I'm a self-starter. I just, we had nothing except my inheritance to work with and, and, uh, corporations, <laughs> and corporations are, are people. Uh, nice, That's yes. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so Obama was, was clever rhetorically at, at the very least, right? Yes, and I think, you know, the thing about Obama is he has incredible charisma, certainly like the best raw politician of the last like 50 years. But you you saw what happened when he wasn't there anymore to defend that that record, which is a terrible record, I would say, very bad. Um, you put that in the hands of Hillary Clinton, who is not just a mediocre politician, but a bad politician. She got stomped by a reality TV show host. And I think that, you know, this I, this is maybe where it gets into the thing, how things are different, because, you know, the fact of the matter is, like, things are bad in the U.S. in a lot of ways, you know, especially if you live in Detroit or something. But, like, they're not that bad. They're not, like, 1932 Germany bad. And this, I think, gets in the other half of the equation, which I don't think... It, it's related to economics, but it doesn't have... It, it's it's It's... Only partly. So it's cultural and it's economic. Yes, absolutely. Let's see if I know where you're going with this. So yeah. Let me guess. Can I guess? Okay, go, okay. go ahead and guess. Let me, I'll... I'm going to take a guess. Here, here's the cultural thing, right? So in raw absolute terms, people might be well off, but the ways in which people and their expectations culturally are tied to capitalism's promises, right? Promises of success, of wealth, of status, of uh, the ways in which you're deemed to be a, a worthy person in a capitalist system, and the, the relative inequality and the, and the ways in which different groups are pitted against each other makes somebody who might be objectively or in raw um, you know, dollar terms doing okay feel tremendously tremendously unequal on, on a level uh, and wanting to be empowered, right? Because they see this vast inequality in wealth and status that they think they're entitled to because of the ways in which capitalism has promised them that they can do it too. They can, they can be a billionaire like Trump too, essentially. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's part of what I was kind of getting at, you know? And, and I think like that, that more or less is like the, the kind of subtext of conservative politics. And I think that this is, this is the difference I was getting at, which is that you just have this, this cultural movement of conservatism, which is sort of like built up on itself to become this, you know, just seething stew of lunatic conspiracy theories and, and, and paranoia and bigotry and lies um, and propaganda over the years, you know, starting with, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh in the mid 1990s. And even, well, even back before then, all the way back to the Burt, John Birch society and the, which was absolutely loopy back in the day. They thought Eisenhower, they thought the army was full of, they thought the troops were communist, basically, back right, back right. in the day. And that... Well, you know, the, you know there, there's something to the, the psychological um, benefit of these kind of conspiracy theories, right? That, you know, going back to the paranoid style, uh, Hofstadter, or any number of insights into um, paranoid ideologies... Um, when when someone's moral agency or just agency generally is undermined by a system like capitalism and they don't actually have much power or ability to change things for themselves, there's a lot of power to be found in displacing that agency onto uh, others that you can be paranoid about, other groups that are actually uh, those who you can explain Right, and you can explain away your lack of agency because they actually have all the agency; they have all the power, right? And if you can do that, then you can psychologically kind of still and quell the the rage and the suffering and the pain at the lack of of agency and power to control your own life. And, and I think that that makes a lot of sense in in, in the uh, context of capitalism and what it does to people's agency. Yeah, and this you know this could be a good opportunity to bring up uh, <clears throat> an an essay you you sent me um, from the L.A. Review of Books called the Super Managerial Reich, um, which is it's just about how basically like German business conservatives were all in on Nazism, like they were just like, oh, this is great, we're making tons of profits, and um, you know, wholeheartedly subscribe to it as a system because it, it benefited their their bottom line and it benefited their basic ideology, which was that, like, they should be given high pride of place in terms of the operation of society. And this is somewhat different, again, over the, over the you know, the development of the American extreme right. But all of these conspiracy theory, you know, propaganda organs you're talking about, Gold Sales, Fox News, Alex Jones, QAnon, um, uh, those, all those are businesses and all of them are very profitable. And one of the kind of perhaps somewhat unintended side effects of the neoliberal policies like tax cuts and deregulation is they make them more profitable. You cut taxes on rich people, you cut taxes on inherited wealth, you cut regulations on like what you're allowed to advertise on, what sort of things you're allowed to say, what sort of scams you're allowed to perpetrate on people. Um, that increases the wealth and increases the 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 power of the kind of uh, whack jobs who were, uh, you know, bankrolling this sort of thing and sort of like setting it up as a self-perpetuating going concern. And also then uh, campaign finance, you know, as like right wing judges undermine legal limits on campaign finance reform. that also increases the 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 um, influence of the far right, you know, and in, in many cases, I think that's their keystone thing. You've seen a lot of very close races where it's like you have a compelling lefty or a liberal candidate, which loses to a right wing candidate that just outspends them 10 to one. And you just, you know, you, you deluge them in advertising and, and propaganda and all that kind of thing. And so in that sense, the, the kind of capitalism business angle reinforces itself and sort of reconciles the the business class to this kind of politics as you're seeing you know all the wall street people are completely fine 
All the Wall Street people are going to the Saudi Arabia Investment Conference. They don't give a fuck if they if uh, Mohammed bin Salman cuts some journalists into pieces and puts them out in a dozen Ziploc bags. That's, you know, is that going to cut the BlackRock uh, uh, profit margin this quarter? No. It's an amazing thing. It's 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 an amazing uh, collaboration and, and with interesting historic uh, historical parallels right to the Nazi regime, um, where the people uh, being the base that support, say, Trumpism, um, are are revved up in a populist way against elites and, you know, the, the Clintons being a classic case. But somehow, because of the ways in which they are animated to... Um, lash out against distinct groups of people, whether it's Antifa, whether it's uh, the Mexicans, whether it's, um, you know, a, you know, a, any number of like sexual assault victims or, or just the libs generally who are uh, trying to police discourse, a, any number of cultural touchstones that allow uh, a false empowerment of people who are, uh, are otherwise actually harmed, um, actually, by capitalism and, and the economic system in place. Somehow, there's this uh, kind of magic show trick where they think they're on the side of uh, an anti-elite, popul- anti-elite populist leader who has their interests and, and their will at heart. Uh, in actuality, right, there's a perfect collusion between the super rich and the political leadership. And that seems to be um, a pretty close parallel, right? Uh, there are other differences that are very salient and important, but, but that seems to be something that, um, that is operating very well is, uh, the, the, the rhetoric of, of populism on the right, uh, uses the othering of these groups to distract from its actual collusion with the economic system that is truly harming the people. Now, one of these putative moves that restrict free trade and actually are more isolationist or putatively anti-free market that um, you know claim the support of these right-wing populist voters, right? Uh, actually, all Trump has done really so far in actuality is a massive tax cut that, that helps uh, the elite and the rich. Um, but the the rhetoric, at least, uh, serves to distinguish him from the neoliberals. So so there's this perception reality game going on, um, and and there seems to be just a lot of sim- symbolism that that keeps animating the people uh, to think that something has changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a this is a good opportunity to bring up one of my favorite. Um, essays on politics on political economy of all time it's called the political aspects of full employment by Mikhail Kalichki I think a Polish economist and um, it's it's basically about why uh, capitalist businessmen uh, resist calls for uh, you know they resist policies that would restore employment and profits and production. And they say that it's, it's, uh, he, he argues that it's basically about ideology and it's about power that, you know, one thing that happens when you have a full employment policy, which means like spending lots of money on big business uh, or sorry, on on uh, public works projects, on subsidies for uh, you know workers and so forth, is that you undermine the control of capitalists over the uh, <clears throat> policy of society, and um, you know he he says uh, you know in the in the days before you have Keynesian stimulus policy to restore employment. Uh, you have, you know, you have to worry about the crisis of confidence. And so policy, like, uh, he's, he says, um, under a laissez-faire system, the level of employment depends to a great extent on the so-called state of confidence. If this deteriorates, 
private investment declines, which results in a fall of output and employment. Um, this gives the capitalists a powerful indirect control over government policy. Everything which may shake the state of confidence, confidence being a word that is still very, very common in t- today's parlance, um, must be carefully avoided because it would cause an economic crisis. But once the government learns the trick of increasing employment by its own purchases, this powerful controlling device loses its effectiveness. Hence, budget deficits necessary to carry out government intervention must be regarded as perilous. The social doctrine of, er, <clears throat> sorry, the social function of the doctrine of sound finance is to make the level of employment dependent on the state of confidence, and that I would say is the 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 clearest explanation uh, ever written as to why uh, people freak out about the national debt in this day of our Lord, twenty eighteen. <laughs> um, well, it's just like 70 years after he wrote this essay, but that, that, that ideological mechanism is absolutely alive and well, but, uh, you know, he, t- he talks about a, a number of other things, but he also discuss, discusses fas- fascism and how it solves this, this political problem. He says, uh, one of the important functions of fascism as typified by the Nazi system was to remove capitalist objection to full employment. The dislike of government spend, <clears throat> government spending policy as such is overcome under fascism by the fact that the state machinery is under the direct control of a partnership of big business with fascism. The necessity of for the myth of sound finance, which served to prevent the government from offsetting a confidence crisis by spending, is removed. In a democracy, one does not know what the next government will be like. Under fascism, there is no next government. The dislike of government spending, whether on public investment or on consumption, is overcome by concentrating government expenditure on armaments. Finally, discipline in the factories and political stability under full employment are maintained by the new order, which ranges from suppression of the trade unions to the concentration camp. Political re- pressure replaces the economic pressure of unemployment. You know, so so basically he's saying that the the political objections of big business to you know full employment policy is resolved under fascism by including them in the kind of like policy making apparatus to an extent and 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 directing the full employment stuff in a way that it doesn't disturb the social hegemony of of business over domestic policy Yes, the, and the way I would put it is this, right? So in both uh, capitalism and, and its kind of late version, what we call neoliberalism since the 1970s, uh, there are obviously, uh, and, and I think almost inevitably, these monopolies within um, capitalism that become so powerful politically that they es- they essentially... Uh, control the ways in which the political system in the United States operates and, and the, how the laws benefit them, right? So a large degree. Uh, the ways in which those particular companies arose is somewhat arbitrary insofar as like the quote-unquote invisible hand of the market uh, led to those specific companies and those people having that power. The fact that a small number of companies and a small number of people had the power was inevitable in the system. But that was the mechanism, the kind of uh, invisible hand mechanism that uh, led to, to the specific people that had it. Now, under national socialism, right, you have the same situation where uh, a small number of, of oligarchs, uh, super managerial um, you know, elite, also worked with the regime in order to uh, have that power. But it was not directed uh, arbitrarily through this kind of uh, self-regulating invisible hand system. Instead, it was kind of top-down, dictated by uh, the fascists. The the net effect, however, is the same. A, A collaboration between political leadership and a small elite of capitalists, um, at the expense of the people. Now, the, the the difference is the ideology in neoliberalism justifies and allows it to persist uh, by promising the people that they too 
can, uh, you know, achieve the American dream and be part of uh, this elite. They can have um, a life of, of freedom and success and whatever they want, as long as they allow, right, the uh, unfettered capitalism, which is actually crony capitalism, um, you know, but, but called unfettered capitalism um, to, to operate. Similarly, that uh, allegiance ideologically to this magic solution that will grant them their, uh, their dreams is paralleled by the Nazi regime and the ideology tied to kind of a uh, Darwinian uh, race science, um, white supremacist. Um, y- you are meant to, to have a destiny of greatness because of your race and so forth. This was the same uh, kind of... Uh, brainwashing necessary to say that their will, the people's will, this democratic will is being represented in this system of collusion collaboration between the political leadership and the oligarchs, right? So similar um, goals, similar power structures in certain ways, and similar brainwashing to get the people to back it. Uh, so that's kind of how I would uh, parallel these these two things historically. There's a lot of uh, important differences, of course, but fundamentally, um, private capital in the hands of a small group of people, uh, giving lie to the notion that it's really kind of a, a democratized system of um, economic success, uh, operates both in collusion with uh, elite political leadership uh, at the expense of the people, right? Um, very specifically in, in fascism, of course, the expense of certain groups of people, especially. Yeah, and <clears throat> I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it. And and perhaps, like, maybe to draw out the contrast between, you know, traditional fascism and the, the, the right-wing authoritarian sort of quasi-fascism we're seeing in, in a lot of countries. Um, so far... We haven't actually seen, you know, the these right wing regimes uh, ac- ac- across the the world really going for full employment policy. That's a very big and a very important difference. You know, P- Trump sort of made out like he was maybe going to do that, like he was going to, I'm going to protect Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Um, but when he got into power, it turns out Trump's really stupid. It doesn't know anything about. <laughs> policy has no idea how the government works and so he was just slickered by all these republican guys who came into office and um so he he has not yet made that final connection between uh uh you know right uh kind of right-wing populist culture war grievance stuff and actually trying to address the needs of your perhaps only white people population um, that is voting for you. And, you know, it's it, it, instead it seems as though they're trying to sort of resolve this, this contradiction by just going all in on culture war stuff. So the corporations and the rich people get their tax cut and the the republican base gets like really 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 whipped up um uh just just flagrant racism and like literal nazis running in in many uh places but so so far i have not you know there's no national politician who who is making the 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 truth the true fascist set of policies which which is like really violent eliminationist genocidal racism plus kind of quasi Keynesian economics. It's not full Keynesianism because it's usually like we're going to spend a quadrillion dollars on, you know, uh, arms and building up the military and like conscription and so forth. But like, you know, at the, at, at the same time, it's still like, you know, we're going to restore full employment and that, you know, full employment is not a word in the Republican vocabulary at all. Even now, no, and and you know, and it might be because Trump's stupid. Certainly, he is stupid. Uh, it might be too that he doesn't actually have the will to power, if you will. No, he doesn't. Uh, that that you know what I mean. Like, he his thumos might not actually be his spiritedness might actually not be very strong at all. And, and in fact, he might just be a petty. 
uh, oligarch who is using that rhetoric to give cover for for him to kind of make deals with Saudi Arabia or whomever else that might line his his pockets personally after he's done. Um, but in, in any case, though, the rhetoric serves as cover for organic developments politically in the body politic um, that. Uh, you know, aren't going to be fostered as quickly and as dangerously without the proper leadership in that respect and without the proper policies, like you say, that that, that would have aided uh, and abetted that. But um, I do want to have a little, there's a quote here I think that might be interesting to, to kind of um, consider uh, with respect to why certain segments of the, of the population, uh, f- you know, become part of groups like Proud Boys and, and why there might be this kind of thirst for um, that kind of fascistic um, movement, right? So, so there's, a, there's a book by a philosopher, Brad um, Evans, who is a great philosopher, and he, uh, he writes a lot on violence. Uh, there's a book called Disposable Futures, The Seduction of Violence in the Age of Spectacle. And he's quoting Primo Levi and then commenting on the quote by Primo Levi. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll cite, cite the quote here. So, quote, the harsher, this is Primo Levi, the harsher the oppression, the more widespread among the oppressed is the willingness with all its infinite nuances and motivations to collaborate Terror, ideological seduction, servile imitation of the victor, myopic desire for any power whatsoever. And then Brad Evans writes, Central to to Levy's analysis here is the way in which the spectacle of violence becomes a substitute for human empowerment, a last refuge, if you will, for those who are already condemned by the system. Yeah. And I I think that's a pretty accurate portrayal of what must be psychologically motivating so many proto-fascists um, who have no real ways to achieve uh, the kind of status or success that, that we spoke of earlier, but who at least in their suffering, right, can collaborate with a system. And like, if you can't beat them, join them, right? And, and at yeah. least have the kind of uh, substitution for true empowerment through the spectacle of violence and, and all the ways in which um, violent struggle can, um, can replace otherwise uh, real empowerment and fulfillment. I think that's, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe a good, uh, a good note to finish up on. Have any, any final comments there? I, th- I just think we, we probably should talk about this more at some point. Um, the role of – it leads to lots of good questions. Yeah. So we've seen some parallels. We, we've seen uh, these burgeoning, if, if yet small in number, um, proto-fascists versus anti-fascists. Uh, we know that Trump uh, and largely believe his rise, uh, although, as Corey Robbins says, still weak um, – objectively his numbers are low his actual uh, support isn't great nonetheless represents a, a real distinct movement that uh, reminds us of that failure historically of economic liberalism that gives two real choices socialism or barbarism and if we don't you know keep an eye on um, the theoretical underpinnings and, and psychological underpinnings um, we, we might uh, be making a political mistake and and, and be ceding some grounds to uh, kind of a right wing uh, movement that will gain power before we realize that it could. So I, I think it's just something to keep an eye on going forward. We should probably investigate violence politically, what we think the nature of violence is philosophically, perhaps uh, what we think of, of Antifa or what we think of the role of, of uh, violence politically today and, and the left's um, evaluation of its role in, in politics and uh, there's any number of things. So, so I'll, I'll pass the baton to you, but I just think that this is, this is a beginning, um, of a, of a larger, broader discussion. Yeah. Well, that sounds like we, uh, we'll have to do another episode on this and maybe a week or two. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you everyone. Keep, uh, emailing us and, and if you like rating, rating us and reviewing us on the iTunes and, yeah, we, uh, we've had some nice interactions on the Twitters, and we appreciate uh, all of you who listen. Yeah, much obliged. We'll be seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.